United Kingdom port of Southampton comes the luxury liner Queen Mary. She carries on her trip from Canada the Dominion's Prime Minister, the Right Honourable William Lyon Mackenzie King. Mr. King is making his first post-war visit to England and the continent. Aboard ship, he is welcomed by Mrs. J.C. Dias, the mayoress of Southampton. Canada's representative is Frederick Hudd, acting High Commissioner in London. The Prime Minister is in England for talks with British government leaders and, if possible, to visit Canadian troops on the continent. The information gained will doubtless play an important part in future Dominion plans for empire solidarity. The stage is being set for the ninth Canadian Victory Loan Drive. Typical is the activity in Aurich, Germany, where posters designed by army personnel tell the story of the first post-war savings campaign for reconstruction. In Oldenburg, the Canadian Provo Corps have taken over a civilian paint shop. Under their supervision, rough designs for victory loan posters are handed over to Jerry artists who work out the finished patterns for road signs and draw them to scale. The scale copies are handed over to the Jerry sign painters who turn out by the dozens the reminders to Johnny Canuck to save for future plans. of Germany and Holland are posted the results of German labor directed to the promotion of Canada's great drive to send over the top the ninth victory loan. The Royal Canadian Navy moves solidly behind the repatriation scheme. Added to the list of vessels which are regularly carrying Canadian personnel of the three services back home is the aircraft carrier HMCS Puncher. A Canada-bound draft fills the great ship, which during the war did such good work in protecting the convoy routes to Britain. An excellent parade ground is the flight deck, while elevators used to lower planes take the repats below decks the easy way. In the hangars once used to store aircraft, bunks have been added to accommodate around a thousand troops. Now a link in the repat schedule, the puncher, off on a six-day voyage, heads for the Atlantic crossing. Sailing down the Clyde, interesting sights are pointed out. In John Brown shipyard, Britain's newest battleship is in its final stage of construction. The puncher's sister ship has given a hearty salute as the journey home gets well underway. Yes, there's real Canadian folding money in that there wad. Even in rough seas, a homeward trip is a pleasant trip, especially on the seagoing airfield, HMCS Puncher. Sailing into the harbor of Piraeus, Greece, the steamer Grips home brings Canada's first ambassador to the Hellenic nation, Major General Lafleche and his family. One of the sons, Francois, served with the Royal 22nd Regiment. Part of the great expansion plan of Canada's diplomatic corps, the Dominion's foreign policy will be fully carried out in Greece by the soldier diplomat. Madame Lafleche and her five children get their first view of the historic nation which is their new home. One of the ambassador's first tasks is to confer with officials of UNRWA, who distribute the immense quantities of essential goods being sent by Canada to Greece. During the German occupation, and immediately afterwards, more than $15 million worth of food was donated directly to the Grecian people by the Dominion. General Lafleche now checks the distribution of later shipments of Canadian goods, which now are distributed by UNRWA. A DSO of World War I and former president of the Canadian Legion, General Lafleche will clearly interpret to the Greek people the Canadian way of life. It's Ravalli at Cedar Springs Camp in southern Ontario and everybody rolls out for a bit of PT. Johnny Canuck Jr. is taking the army training just like Big Brother and Dad did. 
This early morning stuff is a bit trying, but getting down to the real business of soldiering is great stuff to the boys from Ontario's high schools. Cedar Springs is one of the many camps run by the Canadian Army Cadet Corps. In its second year of operation, the Corps already has a force of 60,000 students who are anxious to learn all about the art of soldiering from experts. Everything from signaling to high jumping is taught to develop both brains and muscles. When parades are over, a swim in nearby Lake Simcoe is just the thing for tired foot sluggers. On visitor's day, mum, pop and kid brother bring the lunch basket along and a lot of good things supplement army rations. Girlfriend is on hand also to see Johnny go through his paces on the parade square. When Dad comes home from overseas, Junior will be able to give him some good instructions on the fine points of soldiering, thanks to the Canadian Army Cadet Corps. Into Hong Kong Harbor, the British fleet sails to receive the Japanese surrender of the important Far East stronghold. Coming ashore ready for anything, the troops encounter sporadic resistance from fanatics in the heart of the city. They are cleaned out and the whole area combed by patrols who disarm all Japanese troops and restore order. Hong Kong is a name to be remembered by Canadians. In November 1941, a Canadian brigade, including the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles of Canada, landed to augment the British garrison. Fighting with British units, they were forced to surrender on Christmas Day through lack of water. Now the shoe is on the other foot. Thoroughly beaten, the Nipponese are searched for hidden weapons before being herded to prison camps on the mainland at Kowloon. The last of the major Japanese surrenders takes place at Hong Kong Government House. From the flagship Duke of York comes Admiral Fraser to be present and Vice Admiral Harcourt to preside at the signing. The historic document received the signature of Major General Okada who concludes his part of the ritual with the surrender of his Sumari sword to the Allied party. The second Jap to brush stroke his name is Vice Admiral Fujita. Thus the ceremony which means freedom for thousands of Allied prisoners is concluded in the last stronghold of the Japanese co-prosperity sphere. Even while the documentation is in progress, the town itself is rapidly getting back to its normal routine. Thanks to victorious allied might, a new day dawns for the outpost of empire, Hong Kong. In the nation's capital, the rugby season opens with the initial game in the 1945 ORFU series. Team captains lay a wreath at the flagpole in honor of teammates who have died in the war. Mayor Stan Lewis of Ottawa kicks off to open the match between Ottawa Trojans and Toronto Indians. The old aerial tactics don't net the Trojans much ground. The brawn, beef and open play of the Queen City lads continually force the game into Ottawa territory. In the first quarter, a score of 13 to nothing is run up by the Indians. Featured by the stellar play of the Stukas brothers, from there on in, it's Toronto all the way. the odd fight adds spice to the game. That is when the referee earns his salt. But when a spectator tries to take the ball for a souvenir, well, that's too much even for a referee. It's the day for the Oakwood Indians. They just can't do anything wrong. In the final quarter, Toronto plunges for a touchdown. The convert makes the final score in the ORFU curtain raiser, Toronto 19, Ottawa 1. 